Now, uh, what about Euler-Lagrange theorems? That's where I'm a little fuzzy. Ha! I knew it! All right. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce in a simplistic way the Euler-Lagrange equations. So I'm not going to go through any of the derivations or calculated variations, but what I am going to do is um, show how you can use Euler-Lagrange equations to um, solve um, classical mechanical problems. So the Euler-Lagrange equations are interesting um, because they are an alternative way of expressing Newton's laws of, of motion. Um, the physics is identical, but um, the, the method, um, the concepts introduced are somewhat different. Um, but it's an interesting way of doing things, and it's easier in many cases than using a Newtonian method um, for particularly diff more difficult problems, such as um, double pendulums, that kind of thing. Um, but I'm not going to do that now. I'm just going to introduce Euler-Lagrange equations in a very simplistic way. Um, so, without deriving it, this is the Euler-Lagrange equations. Um, the Euler-Lagrange equation. Um, so, it basically says that the time derivative of um, this um, partial derivative of L with respect to um, the derivative of Q um, over time is equal to partial L over partial Q. Um, so this looks complicated, but it's not. I'm just going to go through what all the terms mean. So first, the Q um, is a generalized coordinate. Um, so the way, easiest way to think of it is Q could be position. Um, it doesn't have to be position. You could also ha use um, an angle like theta or, or whatever. Um, but in this case, I'm going to keep it simple. So, so Q is like um, your generalized coordinate. Um, it's a little bit more... Um, general than just position, but in in this example, that's what we're going to use it as. So that's what Q is, your, your sort of position. Um, L is this um, more interesting um, concept called the Lagrangian. And the Lagrangian is, is not easy to uh, explain in a conceptual way because I'm not really sure, I'm not even sure if anyone else is really sure how you can um, understand the Lagrangian physically. It's a quite a nebulous concept that you can really only understand in terms of the mathematics. Um, so I'm not going to try and attempt to paint a, a physical interpretation of what L is. Um, but mathematically, L is simply the total kinetic energy minus the um, total potential energy of the system. So mathematically, it's quite easy to express, but as far as the physical interpretation goes, uh, that's not easy at all to explain, and I'm not even going to attempt to do that. Um, now... With all these concepts explained, so uh, again, we've just got the time derivative of, of the partial Lagrangian with respect to um, the time derivative of the generalized coordinate is equal to partial Lagrangian over partial of the um, um, generalized coordinate. And if you don't know what partial means, just assume that it's like a, a, a normal derivative. There's a subtle difference here, but um, for these simplistic examples, um, it's not going to matter too much. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through these um, equations in a general sense. Um, so let's substitute in the, the definition of the Lagrangian into um, these all Lagrange equations as so. And instead of using Q, which is a generalized coordinate, I'm going to just look at the position. It could be a particle or whatever. So let's have a look at this. Um, so since we're looking at a particle, um, we know that the kinetic energy of a particle is a half mv squared classically. That's the kinetic energy. Um, so we can substitute um, half mv squared into, into this equation here. And then we can start evaluating some of these derivatives. So um, I've just substituted in um, the definition to both sides. Um, so I also what I've done here is I've said that the derivative of the position with respect to time, that's just the velocity. That's just the definition of the velocity. Um, okay, so we have um, this this in, in here and on, on this on this side here. So let's um, start to evaluate. So let's evaluate um, this first term here. So obviously derivatives um, are additive. You can just sum them so that, that's quite straightforward. So let's do, um, differentiate this v squared term. So we take the half m out um, just because um, we're going to assume that the mass is um, independent of the velocity of the particle, which of course it is. We're going to assume a constant mass. Um, so we've got the derivative of v squared with respect to v. So obviously differentiating v squared you get a 2v um, that pops out, um, and the, the two um, clashes with this half to make a one, so you end up with just an mv here. Um, we've still also got this uh, the second term, this 
the derivative of the potential with respect to the velocity. Um, and on this side, you'll note that there's no x in 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 this um, kinetic energy term. Since we're taking the partial derivative with respect to x and ra rather than the total derivative, we don't have to worry about um, implicit relationships. Um, so we can actually just assume that the, the, the partial derivative with respect to x of this is, is zero. So this term is going to disappear. Um, and then we also we have another partial of the potential with respect to x here, the, um, the, the potential over dx. And capital V is the potential, whereas little v is the velocity. Um, so let's keep going. So we've got, um, again, we've got mv here, which is um, just, just some sort of cancelling these terms down. And um, so, so go, going to the next step, we've got um, ddt of mv and um, minus ddt of, of this, this term here is equal to um, um, dv over dx here. And then, of course, we can use the um, product rule to expand this, this out. So we've got v dm dt plus m dv dt. Um, so this is sort of uh, a more general um, law when, you're, when you say that the mass can vary, but I'm going to simplify this later. And notice I've also got rid of this term because the potential doesn't usually depend on um, the velocity of the particle. So of course you're not exact. We're not exactly sure what um, behavior the particle is under the influence of. So um, what's causing this particle to move? Um, but we would assume that most normal sort of um, forces, uh, most fields, most potential fields, um, do not have this velocity dependent term. So it's a very reasonable assumption to say that d potential over um, d velocity is zero. And um, the derivative of the potential with respect to, the, sorry, the negative derivative of the potential with respect to x is um, the force by definition. So we can see that the, um, we have the, the force is equal to this. And this is assuming that the mass can change. But if we assume that the mass is constant for a rather more simplistic scenario, um, we can get rid of this term. And then dv over dt is just the acceleration. And then we have Newton's second law, f is equal to ma. Um, so what we're basically saying by this is that um, f equals ma is one way of looking at things, but another way of looking at things is um, this. And uh, they're, they're equivalent ways of looking at mechanics. Um, this is a more sophisticated way of looking at it, and indeed um, it was a way that Newton looked at um, mechanics as, as well. So there's no real new physics being introduced here, it's just a different way of, a more sophisticated way of um, looking at things, uh, you give you get gives you the same results clearly. So um, there's nothing, um, but it, it's an interesting way of, of of solving problems. So let's do a more specific example, and very little is going to change in this specific example. But I'm just going to sort of show you how you can um, generate some equations and motions um, using the Euler-Lagrange formation, um, and and you then you can apply this to more complicated examples. So again, we've started with the um, um, our Lagrange equation, and this the, we're also going to substitute something in for the potential. So what I'm going to look at is the case of a very simple case of dropping a ball from a height. Um, so under the um, potential of the gravitational potential that is, and we're just going to assume that since we're on Earth, um, we're going to assume um, that the gravitational potential can be approximated by mgh, um, a sort of simple um, t Earth type approximation where the distances in involved are quite small. Um, so we'll, we'll say the potential is equal to mgh, and um, uh, now we're going to solve the Le, um, Lagrange equation. And instead of x, we're going to look at um, the height of the ball. Um, so let's see if we can use the Euler-Lagrange formation to come up with some equations of motion of the ball. So again, it's the same sort of procedure. You substitute your Lagrangian in um, to both sides, um, and then you follow this through. Um, again, um, you're differentiating. Um, this with respect to the velocity, so obviously the diff differential of two uh, v squared is two v, and the two clashes with a half to make one, and then you end up just with m and mv here. Um, there's no v dependent term in, in this, and again you don't have to worry about implicit dependencies because this is a partial derivative, um, so you can ignore that. And on this side we're just looking at the derivative of um, this mgh with respect to h, so we're going to end up with a minus mg. Um, again, assuming that the mass stays constant as we did before, um, we end up with an ma is equal to a minus mg, and cancel the m's we've got the acceleration is equal to minus g, which again makes sense for the case of dropping a ball on 
on um, Earth, for example, your ball is going to accelerate downwards uh, at a rate, um, sorry, at a um, rate of um, equal to the gravitational um, constant g. So that's that's what your acceleration is going to be, 9.81 meters per second per second in the specific case of Earth. And it's the negative sign is there because it's going downwards. So, OK, so the next thing, next thing that can be done here is um, we can look at trying to form some equations of motion. Uh, and this would be the sort of maybe in more complicated problems, the intuitive next step. And if you get um, problems or exercises in maybe your um, undergraduate test or whatever, um, you would often be expected to do this kind of next stage. This is quite straightforward and involves le less new concepts, but it, it would be the intuitive next thing to do. So we have our um, equation of um, motion in a sense, in terms of the acceleration, but we want to come up with a fuller equation of motion in terms of um, our position of the ball. So the way to do that is to simply integrate both sides of the equation. So I'm integrating our acceleration with respect to time and then accelerating. Um, this is just a constant, of course, g um, with respect to time as well. And you can see I'm integrating from zero to t, which is um, some time in the future. So I'm, I'm going to start the clock at t equals zero. So I'm integrating between zero and t. And you can see evaluating this integral, we get the velocity at t minus velocity at zero is equal to minus g times t. Um, uh, and rearranging this to a slightly more um, um, elegant form, we have the velocity is equal to minus gt um, plus the velocity uh, at when the clock started. So when, when, when we decided to start the experiment or whatever. So that's velocity. Um, but let's say we want to know what the height of the ball is. Um, Sorry, this should be this should be h. Um, let's say we want to know what the, the height of the ball is. So we all we have to do is integrate this again. So we integrate the velocity with respect to time to get to get the height, and we integrate both sides. And again, um, integral integral of velocity is with respect to time is height. So we get h of t minus h of zero when the experiment starts is equal to. Um, so obviously, integrating t with respect to time is, is t squared over 2, so that's where the half comes from, um, plus um, your v0 times by t. So then we get this a complete equation here, um, um, minus a half gt squared plus v0 t plus h0. Um, but um, we're going to say that the ball started moving at zero velocity. Um, the ball wasn't moving when it started to fall. So let's say that this term is equal to zero. And then we have our complete equation for the height of the ball in terms of the time that has elapsed since we dropped it. So height is equal to the height that it started off at, uh, and then minus a half g and multiplied by the time squared. So this is a simple problem, and this is not one that you would necessarily need to apply or Lagrange equations to. However, this principle um, is one that you would use for more, far more complicated problems. Um, so if you're doing physics, if you're doing a physics course at university, um, this would be the kind of problem, this would not be the kind of problem you would be expected to solve. You would expect to solve more complicated problems, but um, just in terms of understanding the concepts, this is quite a useful way of starting. Um, so even though you would probably just use Newton's laws to solve quite simple problems like this, uh, for things like double pendulums, um, you would need to use the Euler-Lagrange equations. Um, key th a few things to bear in mind when we look back at um, the Euler-Lagrange formation. Um, this Q is, is, of course, generalized coordinate. It's the sum of um, coordinates. So it doesn't just have to be one um, entity like a ball being dropped. You can do it with multiple objects, so w which makes this, this formation quite powerful. Um, and of course, so K, K, K here is the sum of kinetic energies. And then V is the potential of all the objects in the system. Um, so I, I hope that's useful. Um, thank you.